Jesus teaches a parable about two men, one whose confidence was in his wealth, the other whose confidence was in his God. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, this text will serve as the basis for a meditation. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abram's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. In the name of him whom we praise without end, here in this life, and when at last the angels take us home to Abram's bosom, that we may die unfearing, fellow brothers and sisters still striving to live and die in Christ crucified and risen our Lord. It's dinner time or supper time, whatever you call that evening meal you have. You sit down to this fabulous feast. You start to tuck in. And that's when you hear the wine from under the table. And then all of a sudden you feel that paw on your leg. And then all of a sudden the chin with those big droopy eyes looking up at you. The family dog begging for scraps. But as we study the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus, the Lord did not teach this for dogs. He taught this to you and to me who live in a world that is going to the dogs. And what he's talking about is begging for scraps. Jesus teaches this parable and many around it centering around money because we are told a few verses before this text, he is there amongst the Pharisees who are criticizing them, and yet the Lord can look into their hearts and sees their love of money. So he proceeds to teach them this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Of course, you see poor Lazarus there. You can picture him by the side of this palatial estate just hoping, just praying that anything, anyone will come to show him mercy. 
Now let us be clear, this is not the Lazarus whom Jesus raises from the dead, the brother of Mary and Martha. This is another person. But what is interesting, we know little about him other than he's a beggar and his really bad state of affairs. But to know that his name Lazarus means my God is my help tells you a whole lot because he doesn't have much help. It said he is laid, or rather dumped beside this estate, hoping to do some dumpster diving, but he's too weak to do any of that. He's hoping that the dogs that are going in there and scavenging for some food will actually leave some close for him so that he can snack on it. Well, they give him some comfort but these aren't your pet dogs. These are mutts that roam the streets in packs. And yet that's all Lazarus has for friends. Truly we see him begging for scraps. And then in one of those twists in those parables which Jesus is well known for, all of a sudden, the tables are turned. The rich man who had never a care in the world, who didn't think about anybody else, probably didn't even know or pay attention to that poor beggar by the side of the road, probably didn't even know his name. We don't even know his name because his name is not written in the book of life in God's eyes, in, according to Jesus in this story. This rich man dies... And before he had everything, and now he has nothing. While Lazarus, trusting in his God, had the true treasure which never perishes, spoils, or fades, and where thieves cannot break in and steal, where no moth and rust or vermin will destroy, he had the one thing needful. He had the treasure of trust in God to get him through all things. And so now he's basking in bliss by Abraham's side. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. Abraham, the man who was looked with favor in God's eyes. Yes, he was not perfect, but he knew he was forgiven and God blessed him and God blessed his people. And so when we talk about being by Abram's side, Abram's bosom, everybody knew Abraham is in heaven, so obviously this is a reference to heaven. That Lazarus is there enjoying the peace and splendor and bliss of an eternity while that rich man now is begging for scraps. In hell, he is in such torment that as the story goes, and remember we don't take everything literally, there is one main point. Jesus is using some picture language to certainly forward this point and get us to understand and picture in our mind in hell, he's able to see heaven, sees Abraham, sees Lazarus. And of course, his pride and arrogance has not been thwarted by that eternal flame scorching his soul. He begs, send Lazarus, send him as my servant. Just have him dip his finger in some water. Just give me some momentary relief from all this pain and suffering and torture. Of course, that's not the worst of it. The worst is being separated from God, whom he didn't care about because money was his God. He himself was his God. But now he knows nothing about God, and God knows nothing of him. And yet he is still looking for some creature comfort, any creature comfort. And so he's begging for scraps, just a little bit of water 
for a minute amount, which Abraham then replies, that ain't possible, boy. And so then the story comes to another group begging for scraps. Oh, I have five brothers. I don't want them to be here. I don't want them to yell at me and harass me and torment me so much. Or maybe I just don't want anybody else there, but it's hard to believe that he would be thinking of anybody else even in that state, even when he asked for water to be placed on his tongue. No. I know what you can do. Abraham, send Lazarus back. Have him rise from the dead. They'll be convinced that, oh no, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the Bible. No, 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 no. Send a miracle. Somebody rising from the dead. And then Abraham responds with the key point to this text. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Those brothers were begging for scraps. They were like their rich brother was, living high on the proverbial hog. They were living it up. They had no need for God because they had all they wanted or desired. And that was their cross. And that was their downfall. And then, when absent from God, should that have even occurred, should that miracle have even happened, that Lazarus came back from the dead? Well, if they're not going to believe in the God, a God who can raise the dead, how would they believe in that miracle of a beggar dead and brought back to life? They were begging for scraps, although they didn't know it or realize it. My brothers and sisters, the point of this parable is not how four-year-old Jackson thought it was after he heard it in Sunday school and went home and emptied out his piggy bank and started counting his nickels and dimes and quarters when his grandma saw him and said, you should put that money back in the piggy bank. No, Grandma, I just heard from the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus that the rich go to hell. And there are many people who would say that this is all about giving all your wealth to the poor, otherwise you're going to go to hell. No. Certainly to squander wealth is a sin. To not help your neighbor is certainly a sin. But to be blessed with wealth is a blessing from the Lord. We talk about Abraham in our text. He was a multimillionaire. He had three, over 300 trained servants who were willing to go into battle with him. That's just the trained servants. What about the others? He had flocks and herds. God had truly blessed him. And he was a man after the Lord's own heart. He trusted in God and was placed in such situations offering up his son, going to a place that he knew nothing about as the place promised to him. That is faith. Believing in what you cannot see. He was truly blessed with money, but he didn't let money rule him. That is not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is we have treasures in God's Word. Do we beg for a scrap of a scripture verse here or there that we can read, learn, and meditate upon? Not just for this moment in worship, but throughout the rest of the week or throughout the rest of the day or throughout the rest of the morning 
for the evening. Are we glad when we say, let us go to the house of the Lord? Or are there other cares and worries and other things on our plate that we are just too busy to go to worship or to take time for devotion or even take a moment to just pray? My brothers and sisters, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. But let's look at our schedules. Let's look at our checkbooks. Let's look at our regular routine. Are we blessing the Lord with how we live and move and have our being all the time? Do we work? Do we play? Do we pray? Do we love our neighbor? Do we love our family? Do we hear the word of God? And do we obey it? And when we look upon our lives, when we look upon our schedules, we say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We haven't been begging for scraps of Scripture. We haven't been begging at all. We've been too busy with other things, thinking that those things are important. But you can't take it with you. We well know that. There is a part, a favorite scene of mine in the movie Mary Poppins. When you've got that bird woman at the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral calling out, Feed the birds, tuppence a bag. And Mary Poppins brings her two wards, Jane and Michael, there, tells them about them, that the saints and apostles, all atop statues atop St. Paul's Cathedral, look and smile anytime anybody has some care and concern for someone or something else, including those birds. And then their father, Mr. Banks, takes them to the bank just around the corner. And when Jane and Michael want to feed the birds, he's too blind with thinking about work and about money. He can't see past the end of his nose to see what that's really talking about. It's not helping the birds, but helping that bird woman out. That poor, scraggly, pigeon-dropping, filled washerwoman asking for help. My brothers and sisters, are we too blind to see past the ends of our noses? Those whom God has entrusted us to encourage and care for. Should we be the ones like that rich man begging for scraps in hell? Thank God, we will never have to experience that suffering and torment and separation from God. Because we have a Savior who was rich, yet for your sakes and mine, he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He came down to this world going to the dogs and lived among a people that behaved like dogs, but he lived perfectly, even when we didn't. And then he took all that perfection with him. And when people basically cast him to the dogs saying, crucify him, He took all those times we did not love our neighbor as ourselves. He took all those times we loved our money more than we loved our Lord. He took all those times when we placed ourselves in the place of God rather than the God who created the heavens and the earth who created us. He took all those shortcomings, those failings, those trespasses, those sins of treachery and treason upon himself. He became poor. 
he emptied himself of all his holiness and riches of glory. And he gave them fully and freely to you. He loved you so much that he went to the very steps of hell so that you would never have to experience that suffering and agony. He became poor so that you might be rich, rich in faith, rich in blessings, rich in provision, taking care of our bodies and souls and lives all the days of our lives. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day, give us today our daily bread, and he gives us that bread and far, far more even when we don't even ask, even when we are too busy to ask. He gives it to us anyway because he loves us and gives us so much more, providing for our bodies as well as providing for our souls. Because he gives us more than just his word. He helps us beg for scraps of the sacrament, a little drop of water upon our head, and the sign of the cross on our head and heart to mark us as a redeemed child of God. He invites us to beg for a mere morsel of bread and for a sip of wine, thereby giving us more than just bread and wine giving us his very body, giving us his very blood, giving us his very self, the best meal, the costliest meal of all. Oh yes, salvation is free for you and me, but it didn't come cheap. It cost the Lord his own son. But he wanted you and me to be rich because he loves you and will care for you always. There was a road down in Kentucky, much like the one down on 107th, when a person new to the area turned the corner and saw a big sign that said road closed. But he looked down and all he could see was just nice paved road. What's up with that sign anyway? Road closed, turn around, that. He drove for a mile or two until he came to a place where a bridge once was. Can't cross it. Turned around, and as he came back to that place where the sign said road closed, he saw some spray-painted words on the back side of that sign. Welcome back, stupid. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, God has so richly blessed us. Why do we trust in those blessings, those gifts, when we should be trusting in the giver? Welcome back to the fold. You can insert the terminology there. Yes, we may be silly sheep, but we are sheep of his pasture. The Christian life is to be one of repentance. Repent those sins of lack of trust. Find forgiveness in word and sacrament, in God's free and faithful grace for you and live in that love now and always. Upon his deathbed, a scrap of paper was discovered next to Martin Luther. And his last words that he wrote in this life before angels took him to Abram's bosom, the last earthly words he wrote are these. We are beggars, that is true. Thank God that when we go to God in prayer, begging 
for scraps, that through Christ, our Lord hears us and answers us with just that what we need and so much more in this life and most definitely in the life to come. Amen.